if everything was handed to you in a paper plate, you know, you wouldn't feel some sort of achievement. No one saw me, you know, working until like 1 a.m., closing a restaurant, waking up the next day, doing a valet job, going to practice, going to school, and then doing it all over again. You're sacrificing now for hopefully an abundance of wealth and life in the future. You know, if you're why to have this huge portfolio or to, you know, retire early or to have all this money, all this passive income coming in is bigger than, a, than your wants then you'll keep on going. Kind of like with dividend investing, just sacrificing is the main goal. And a lot of people don't know how to sacrifice. The thing that people don't understand is how big your shovel is and how much you're investing in the market. So if you're investing a ton of money, then you'll get to their goal faster than somebody who's not investing less money. You know, if you're investing 500 bucks a month at a 10% annual return over the next 30 years, your return is, I think, believe just shy of a million. You invest a thousand bucks a month, that's that's two million. You know, two, 1,500 bucks a month, three million. Of course, the goal is the million, million dollar portfolio. You kind of get there and you're like, this is it. Like I thought I was supposed to have some life changing feeling. There's always another goal in life. It's all about, you know, progressing forward and never looking on the past. Investors, welcome back to another go round of Masters of the Market. Now this week, I am amped up to be joined by Marcos Mia, who he just surpassed one hundred thousand dollars so marcos welcome to masters of the market i just want to get right to it here and start off with the big question of what exactly is your story how did you get to where you are today totally man i'm super excited to be here so to kind of i guess step back my story kind of began investing when i was 18. it all started with with the vu was my first investment the s p 500. Uh, i guess growing up my dad really instilled a lot of good investing values especially finance values what happened was I knew that I had to work to, I guess, save up a lot of money and to just invest it for the long run. So I had quite a bit of jobs, probably everything that you could think of, busing, serving, you know, like a grocery store, plumbing, so many jobs to the point where I, I can't even put it all on LinkedIn into one, I guess, full resume. But basically I had a very big curiosity in investing and Whenever I would have any questions with investing in money, I would always go to my dad. I guess growing up, he kind of instilled to me, like I said, the values of investing and the true, I guess, meaning in, in why we invest for the long run. And that's just to, you know, obviously to have time and freedom and hopefully to have an abundance of wealth so we could, you know, do what we want, right? Without having others to tell us what to do, but also to give. Throughout school, uh, I went to college. I just graduated a couple of years back. Like I said, worked a ton, got a scholarship to run cross country and track. That was kind of like my background and my ticket to hopefully not get into any debt, which I don't have any debt right now. And yeah, uh, just the S&P 500 was something that me and my dad talked about a lot growing up. Uh, we definitely read our fair share of books and watched a lot of videos. And then um, I guess going through, going through school, I had, like I said, big curiosity. I took a couple of classes in personal finance and realized the dividends the, of my dad teaching me investing kind of started to pay off when going to these classes about investing not not like super deep investing because they can't get financial advice in school but kind of like the principles like you know what's an etf what's a stock personal finance skills like you know debt uh credit cards etc and i'll be the, the person answering every single question just throwing up throwing my hand up and just being that kid i guess annoying the professor with all the answers i try to give and i just knew that eventually i wanted to start a channel and i would be on runs with my buddies, we would be running quite a bit. And I would just talk about investing in stocks and they're like, okay, like you should be able to do this on YouTube. And then it's just been uploading one video and I guess it's been history ever since. So I'm super thankful for the people who subscribe and watch my, my channel and, you know, to network with other great people like yourself. So I really appreciate it. I think one of the biggest pushes for me to, to get you on here, Marcos, was the fact that you hit a hundred thousand dollars not too long ago as we were speaking before we jumped on here, but you hit it at such a young age and it, it's rare. I mean, I was just talking to someone who's in their thirties and they just hit 100 K. So I want to talk about your background in this whole deal. Like some of those lessons your dad taught you early on, what was it about finance and investing that hooked you and got you in this mindset of like, instead of spending my dollars on the craziness that typically face it youngsters do yeah. let me put it into the market yeah i, I guess to kind of everyone's gonna be asking like you know how, how i got to that number because it is pretty rare and it was just being frugal with my money and smart like growing up when i first had a job i, I believe just over 
almost like before I was 17 or maybe I just turned 17, my dad would be like, yeah, that paycheck, like that's going in your account. And I didn't know it was in VU, but cause I, I would just throw it in there and he chose the fund for me. I really didn't even look at what the Vanguard fund was, which was VU. And yeah, he would just be like, yeah, that money's going in there. And every paycheck I would work, boom, 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 boom. And then uh, it became one, you know, working 15 hours a week, part-time to 20, 30, 40. And then when I was running and studying in school, it was like any free time I had, I was working. And a lot of people would, were like kind of criticizing that because you want to be, you know, when you're running D1 cross country and track, your legs need to be fresh. And we run like 15 miles, uh, you know, not just straight up because we're working out. Right. And I would go <laughs> into my car, put on my, 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 you know, work outfit and I'll go to work till like 11 o'clock at night then wake up at 6am do it all over again. So it was just knowing that I had to work hard for it. And I guess being in California, the whole stereotypical thing is kind of, I guess, flaunting your money, I guess, living the life you're not supposed to live. You're not, you're not really truly living. And I don't know, I was always drawn to, to businessmen and into people in finance and to just motivational speakers. And I just knew that I just wanted that just spending your money and you know, living a paycheck to paycheck was, was no way for me to live. And I never, I never knew I was going to be, or I never thought I was ever going to be in a paycheck to paycheck situation because I had full confidence that I would, you know, go to school if I do well, then I could land a good finance role, which I'm, a, I work in finance and now I do YouTube. And then I also have a couple businesses on the side. Um, so I'm just working a ton and you got to love what you do. I, I guess back to your question on, um, you know, why a hundred thousand or, or why I'm doing it is I always ask myself that question because you, you walk around all these different places and you see other people on social media and you're like, wow, I could buy that and I can afford that. And you know, why am I investing, uh, lately it's been like a thousand bucks a week when I could, you know, go on a vacation or whatnot. And I guess growing up, my dad, we never took a vacation. Um, never had nice things. We were comfortable, but you know, it's just like. It's kind of like, if you know, you know, and my dad always told me that, um, just like, keep it to yourself. And, uh, eventually, you know, when, when there's a time and place for it, you could spend that money and you could, you know, give back. But w once you're young twenties, thirties, like I plan on working forever and I plan on working hard. I guess my whole life's been working hard. I've, you know, worked a lot of hours and, uh, it was funny because I ran a hundred mile ultra marathon right before I started, I started working. In, in, in my first like real job, my job, my career and it was like, no, like no training whatsoever to like two weeks preparation. And just because I just want to prepare myself for the future, I'm always up to do hard things. And one thing that's hard is being frugal and, and saving your money. And I guess another thing that's kind of hard is in, in investing for the long run because people want money right now. And that's not how it works. You, you see all the, the richest people in the world. And I guess, you know, in the cities you're in, the countries you're in, and they're not young, you know, they're, let compound interest ride and they made the wealth that way. What would you say is the biggest lesson you learned from your father? Never give up. Definitely never give up, man. Like there's gonna be times where you're gonna be down and out. And there's been plenty of times where you're like sitting in your room and you're like, your legs are aching and you're mentally just drained and you don't know if you could do it again the next day or the next week. You know, you're under pressure, especially, you know, being a D1 athlete. You know, you have one good race, you're a student, you have one good semester, one good quarter, and it's like, can I do it again? But can I do it better? Especially with YouTube, it's like, yeah, one good month, you know, can you do it again the next month? Can you do it again the next month? And just never giving up. Like, if you, if, if, if you never give up, you'll always find a way. And that's just a lesson that I'm going to always take from me. I remember running that 100 mile ultra marathon is the last mile. I'm just like crying and so much pain. And we had like a good moment of like, you know, this is what, you know, this is what we do. You know, me and my dad, I have a very close relationship with him. He's always happy to see, I'm always chasing different, different avenues, whether it's in business and finance and YouTube, social media, or just physically and all, all these different goals. And so just never give up is the best piece of advice my dad ever gave me. One heck of a father. Man, it sounds like you hit the nail on the head there with consistency. And I, I almost have this picture in my head now of you crossing the $100,000 mark, like crying, nearly there, you're passing. You're like, I did it. <laughs> yeah. 
I, yeah, it was, it was definitely like a, a lot of people don't realize that when you, you know, you have a huge goal, right? $100,000 in your portfolio, my first $1,000 in dividends, you know, maybe every quarter, a million, you know, of course the goal is the million, million dollar portfolio. Um, you kind of get there and you're like, this is it. Like I thought I was supposed to have some life changing feeling. And of course it's great to reflect, right? I, I, th I think I went to my favorite ramen spot and I got some ramen. It was like 16 bucks. And I just kind of sat there like, great. Like what's the next goal? Cause you're always up to be chasing something. If you're not chasing a goal or a dream or something, then you might as well just like do nothing. So I sat there and I had another goal in mind and I, and I was set crazy goals because if I don't hit the goal, then at least I'll be at a better spot than it was then when I created it. So that's what I'll tell people is, you know, it, you're never gonna be satisfied. I, I guess what you're saying, you have to mentally have a set number why to you know, celebrate something big. But my dad always told me like, you know, there's always another goal and you, you know, in life, it's all about, you know, progressing forward and never looking on the past. Such simple advice, but it's often advice that's overlooked. And I want to ask you why you think that is like, what think about this 1% club, Phil Knight in his book, shoe dog does a phenomenal job of actually talking about what exactly you just shared, which was like, you know, you hit your $100,000 mark. It's like, this is it. So yeah. what is it about like this mentality? How can we shed off this mentality of get rich? What I like to call get rich by Tuesday, be in this thing yeah. for the long game and just realize it's not really about the, the dollar sign. It's not really about the amount. It's like the process. Yeah. And, and, and definitely the process is going to be the best thing because you're not going to be in there forever. Right. Let's just say you're working like a minimum wage job, right? Like you're never going to be there forever. If you have a goal of getting out of it and hopefully getting a, a good paying career, maybe starting your own business, but that's really hard to do. Right. But you know, just if everything was handed to you in a paper plate, it wouldn't feel, you know, you wouldn't feel some sort of achievement. Right. And if something is worthwhile, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take energy. And the best thing is sacrifice. You know, you got everybody in my comment section, like, oh, it's going to take 20 years to hit this goal, 25 years, 30 years, you know, dividend snowball is not going to be rolling until you get a certain amount of money in it. And then of course, time is your, is going to be your best friend, right? Invest when you're young. And then, um, you know, the, the biggest advantage is, you know, when you're young, get to compound interest that grows over time, dividends grow over time, but just sacrificing is the main goal. And a lot of people don't know how to sacrifice. They always live in the now. And the worst part is when, let's say, you know, you put something on a credit card, you, you go do things you're not supposed to be doing. It might feel good for about 15 seconds. And then it's not going to feel good when you look back on it. Like I said, you know, the wealthiest people, I try to surround myself a lot of smart people, you know, the diverse backgrounds. And so I could have good mentors. Like I said, you know, it all comes from experience. You know, you want to be a CEO of a company, you want to be um, demanding this sort of pay uh, at a company or maybe your own business. It takes experience. It's, it doesn't take sheer luck. Now, of course, there's going to be some outliers, right? But if we look at the reality of, of what, the world we live in, it's all about you know, hard work and sacrifice and just having that persistence of, I will not give up until I achieve set a goal. And for me, it's just like how my, my mind works is I will not, well, you know, whatever's in my way, you know, is, is not enough for me to stop. And if I hit a goal, you know, if I have a goal and I want to achieve it, I'm just like laser focused in on it. And that just kind of had my, my mentality that I've had, I feel like forever. Marcus, I want to chalk this up for everybody and talk a little bit about how we can get to this frame of mind. Is it possible? Is it like, is it trained and programmed or are we born with this type of mindset? I, I guess I'll kind of like say more like, like one quick story, but a lot of people, I had one person in the comment section, like, how do you invest a thousand bucks a week? You're on 23. And I'm like, no one saw me, you know, working until like 1 a.m., closing a restaurant, waking up the next day, doing a valet job, going to practice, going to school, and then doing it all over again, going to tutoring, tutor, tutor kids for money. Like I was always working and I saved that money. If you don't got it like that, then don't act like you got it like that. Right. But back to your question on like the whole frame of mind, sometimes I do believe you're kind of born with it a little bit. But sometimes I do believe that, you you know, life smacks you up in, in certain ways to where you're kind of forced to think like, you know, think of that certain direction of, you know, that mentality uh, of being driven. And I feel like every, everybody has it, but some people just get pulled into different things. Some people get distracted. I remember going to school 
Um, and there's a lot of distractions in school. You know, did, did I partake in some of them? Of course, right? You know, you want to, you know, you're in college, you want to have some fun. But at the end of the day, like, you know, that's like only when I rewarded myself. My, you know, my dad always gave me this advice of, you know, you could go out, you could do this and that once you, once the goal is complete. But you can't do it for an extended period of time because you have another goal to achieve. You know, it, you're born with it a little bit, but also it can be done if you really make the sacrifice. If you're, if you're, if your why is, if your why is, is huge, then you'll keep on going. Kind of like with dividend investing. I'm an ETF investor myself, but I also have some dividend ETFs in there. But, you know, if you're why to have this huge portfolio or to, you know, retire early or to have all this money, all this passive income coming in is bigger than this, than your wants. All you know, if you're like I said, your why is going to be super huge. But if it's not, then you might as well just like not start investing because you're going to get attempted to you know uh, you're going to go on Instagram, you're going to see all these day traders making a ton of money, or you're just going to have these like get rich quick mentality and kind of like back we would to what we alluded to before, like that's just no way to I guess gain wealth. Well, let's talk about what type of investor you are, how you're investing these days. You shared that you predominantly invest in ETFs. But what type of investor would you classify yourself as? I would definitely class my, my, myself as a ETF investor, more towards growth and capital appreciation. Of course, you know, div, you know most dividend, not dividend ETFs, most ETFs pay a dividend. But like I said, I would classify myself more as a growth investor. Majority of my money is tied up in the S&P 500 with Vanguard's Foo, and then my second highest holding is going to be into growth ETFs. I have a split between the NASDAQ 100 of QQQM and then SCHG. And then the next highest portion is my dividend ETF section, which is going to be iShares DGRO and then SCHD. But one thing I want to clarify, because a lot of people are going to wonder is like in my 401k, I have BTI. And a lot of people in my, in my comment section are like, Marcos, that's fund overlap. Like, like, why would you own VTI and VU? And then there's only so, you know, so much you could say in a video, but it, for my 401k it was either VTI or like bonds. Like there was like no in between. So, I, you know, and it's either I choose VTI and have fun overlap or I go with, bond, with, with bonds and then make like a super low return for like the next, what, 30 plus years. In your portfolio, I try to make mine as like simple as possible, kind of explain it to people, but also make it so when someone looks at a portfolio, they're like, okay, I can tell you're predominantly, you know, predominantly invested in the S&P 500. We also have these other funds because of X, Y, and Z. The power of ETFs is certainly there. And I always like yeah. to say when you're investing into ETFs, it's, it really is. If it's a broad market ETF, like yours are, yeah. a fail safe strategy because you're just ultimately investing in the market. But there are so many people out there that would say, Marcos, man, you're young. Why not just go into these growth stocks? Because you have time. You could afford the risk. Go growth. Go individual growth stocks. What would you say to them? It's a matter of risk tolerance. And I'm a big believer of risk of like identifying what you know investor you are. For me, it's you know investing in ETFs, but also your risk. So for me, I am not as risky to go into individual growth stocks. Yes, they have made a ton of money in, you know, in, the, in the past decades, right? Will they make a ton of money in the future? Probably. Do I know which ones are, are gonna be the biggest winners? Definitely not. So for me, it's a matter of choosing funds like ETFs that have hopefully most of the winners and then the ETF will grow in value because you know the winners are winning more than the losers are losing. Is it fine to have individuals, individual growth stocks individual dividend stocks, of course. Am I willing to do all the research? And a lot of people don't do the research. And for me, it's like, I don't want to deep dive into income statements and, you know, you know, looking at the company's balance sheet and, and the story of the company. You know, I'm not Bill Ackman or Peter Lynch and going in there and seeing what what's the businesses look like in real life. And, and for me, it's just like, it's some more of a simplicity, peace of mind. And can I sleep at night? Of course. Well, I well I personally sleep better at night if I had individual st growth stocks. Probably the same if I keep at a lower weighting. But if I have like a, a good majority of the portfolio, then I've, 
I would be questioning if things go super south or, you know, you're keeping up with earnings calls. And a lot of people don't, don't know the work it takes to truly manage an individual growth portfolio, one where there's earnings calls and you can have, you know, if you have 20 different stocks, 30 different stocks, it just all becomes a lot of, a lot of time. And for me personally, my time is valued in other things than just worrying about what's my stock's going to, you know, if this stock's going to go up or down. We'll flip the coin here and say, it sounds like you're talking a lot about playing it safer, more risk adverse. So come to the dividend side, right? <laughs> why, yeah. why a lot of these dividend companies like Johnson and Johnson, Procter and Gamble, I mean, they're there too. Why not go directly into dividend stocks? That's a good question. And dividend stocks are, are great. And a lot of people really sleep on dividend stocks. So in my channel, it's, I promise started mostly talking about, you know, broad market ETFs kind of dabble into growth and then saw a huge opportunity with, with, you know, I guess some gaps in dividend investing, but for me, I'm like, why maybe I don't include individual dividend stocks is for that same reason of, you know, the time, the research, um, and just the energy. So that's why I have a, a section of my portfolio towards DGRO and SHD because I feel like Picking dividend stocks is going to be a little bit more tricky than picking an individual growth stock. There's a lot more factors to take into place. I feel like if you're looking at, you know, dividend growth and, um, you know, how the business is going to, is going to look like in the next year or two, because most of the, of the dividend companies that are well established, maybe not, might not have that much growth upside compared to a pure growth stock. So it's kind of hard to maybe predict if, Hey, this is this company going to be in the same boat of revenue, you know, is business going to be booming in the next 10, 15, 20 years when maybe there's other competitors or, or, or disruptions in the market. But the cool thing about a lot of dividend stocks is most of their products are quite sticky and a lot of people don't understand that. It's just going to be like a steady stream of capital appreciation alongside, hopefully, a growing dividend. But the one thing you said that really stands out to me, you're able to sleep at night because you're, you don't have the individual stocks in there. You're invested yeah. really in the entire market. So you can't really lose if you're investing over the long period of time. Which brings me now here to this statement, which is that you're playing it incredibly safe, but lucratively. And so many investors would say just what you're doing is just going to take an incredibly long time, right? Like you can expedite the process. Also, it's interesting to note, right? You got guys like Warren Buffett who are just like, just invest in the S&P. Like there's nothing wrong with that strategy. Is those are all the funds that that are in there? Yeah. So my Roth IRA is more of a growth portfolio because like only mentally I was like, I can only invest seven thousand dollars a year. Sure. So the majority is to SCHG. Next highest holding is VU. Next highest holding is DGRO. And the taxable account is the highest account. A majority by a long shot is VU. Next highest holding is QQQM. Next highest holding is SCHD. And then the 401k is 100% to VTI. The only thing I can say here is like, wow, because you, there's so many people, and I'm sure you get it on YouTube as well in the comments, right? Like you could do this, you could do that. And it's like, oh, I'm just going to keep to this system that works and it's extremely simple and it's going to take time, but over time you win. Definitely. I, I would say if you're a new investor or a young investor to look into index funds, which most ETFs are tracking an index. So. I guess it would be ETFs because slow and steady, I always believe does win the race. Then just trying to chase the next big thing or trying to chase short-term gains at the risk of losing a ton of money. But a lot of people don't understand with, with, with investing is we could argue all day about, you know, uh, asset allocation, uh, Roth versus uh, taxable fund overlap. Um, if div investing is going to be better than growth investing, if S and P 500 is better than the total than the total world ETF, we could argue all day about that. But it, the biggest thing that people don't understand is how big your shovel is, and how much you're investing in the market. So if you're investing a ton of money, then you'll get to their goal faster than somebody who's not investing, you know, less money. You know, if you're investing 500 bucks a month at a 10 percent annual return over the next 30 years, your return is I think believe you're just shy of a million. You 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 invest a thousand bucks a month. That's that's two million. You know, two fifteen hundred bucks a month, three million. So the 
the more money you invest, the bigger your nest egg will be. And so that's why I'm always huge on making smart financial decisions, you know, increasing your income or being maybe frugal is the, the wrong word, but being maybe sacrificing a little bit, you know, maybe instead of spending a hundred bucks a month on this, we could cut, we could cut these unnecessary things and then throw that into the portfolio. So you could have your goals be achieved shorter because of compound interest and hopefully you're reinvesting your dividends. So I'm perfectly fine with, you know, mostly average market returns because if the S P 500 is like the majority of portfolio, which for me, it's like 60%, maybe even more, it's like 65% of maybe even 70% of my portfolio, then, you know, if you own like a small sliver of an ETF, then are you really investing in it? Always be long, long term and no strategy is going to be perfect for one person. You know, there's dividend investors, there's growth investors that just want like SMH 100% or, you know, 100% to XLK or BGT. And there's people who are just like vu and chill, you know, there's a lot of like arguments on Reddit and the comment section. It's like, you know, we all have one common thing together and that's to, we're all investors. And, you know, I just hope that sometimes in the, hope in the future we could all get along more than a lot of people <laughs> have, emo, a lot of people have emotional ties to their stocks. Like if you have a, a, a top 10 stocks, top 10 dividend stocks to own for 2024 and your stock's not in it, someone's going to get pissed off. And if your ETF is not in the 10 best ETFs to own for life, someone's going to get hurt. And a lot of people don't understand that like we can't talk about every fund and everybody has different goals and strategies. And kind of like circling back to the summary of this is if your shovel is big enough, that's the only thing that pretty much matters because if you're, let's say you're getting like 8% returns, but you're investing like 2000 bucks a month versus some, the other person is getting like what 10% returns, but they're only investing like 300 bucks a month. Like you're not getting a, you might be getting a better return on paper, but the person who's going to win the longer is the person who's investing more money. So that's kind of the consensus of this conversation. Let's talk about this shovel because I, I totally agree with it. I myself have been a very frugal person, but I'm curious to know from, from you, what does frugality mean? How does it play an integral role in your investment strategy to have the money to invest, to get this quote unquote, big shovel? Always having money on the sidelines. So I, I just posted a video today on like the importance of saving cash because there's gonna be dips in the market and you want to be prepared for those dips. Like it's great to dollar cost average when you get your paycheck and your 401k or you get a paycheck and you're allocating that in the market. But when there's times where the market's going to be falling like 3%, like last week, you want to have that money on the side to be prepared to hopefully lower your cost basis. But when it comes to just being smart with your money or being frugal, you're sacrificing now for hopefully an abundance of wealth and life in the future. It's not like you're, that money's going into the ether where it's just like disappears forever. It's like you're making yourself wealthier when you think about it. If that money is going into a good avenue that yields hopefully some good compound interest. Most of the things it's like a mindset thing. It's kind of just like, hey, I got this paycheck, but if I make, let's say a thousand bucks on a paycheck, 150 of that is not my money. It's into my future investment on my future self and my future life I want to live. And another, you know, 850, it's kind of just like whatever you want with it, you know, necessary bills and what you want to do with it. I know hopefully a lot of people make more than a thousand bucks every two weeks, but it's just kind of like knowing that in the future, hopefully you have some goals and aspirations in life. If you want to, if it involves money and hopefully living in a long, healthy life full of wealth and happiness and abundance, it's going to be achieved, hopefully some sort of money. Like, you know, you know you're eventually not going to work one day and you need to have money to sustain hopefully a good, healthy life. What are the sacrifices? Like, have you lost relationships at all? Sacrificing so much? You, <laughs> does it like, does it matter at the end of the day? Have it lost? It's funny because if we go back to like, vet, like losing money, any decision, I remember like in 2020, like the whole Dogecoin or this coin or this stock, my dad was like, if you do that, like, I'm going to kill you. And I was like, okay, not doing that. Or I'm like, Hey dad, like what's Robin hood? Like everybody's on Robin hood. And he's like, like, I don't know. I don't care. Like what you say, like you're not doing it. So I never partake in any of that. I would say I lost quite a bit of relationships along the way. A lot of people who were like kind of 
not the best influences. And whenever like somebody asks me a question, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're the three, you know, you are a product of like the people you're surrounding yourself with. And I guess for me, it's kind of hard to find people that are on the same journey and goal with, you know, that I'm on, if it's not online with like, you know, YouTube and having all these other people that are on the same journey as me, but the people who, who kind of stayed and, you know, knew like, I'll have someone text me yesterday, like, yo, like, let's go out and, and, and do this and, you know, go, you know, go eat. And I'm like, I can't, like, I have a podcast tomorrow and I have to edit all day. Like I, I have work in the morning, in the morning till afternoon, and then went to the gym for an hour. And then it's like, I have to edit from like 6 PM to like one, like, I'm sorry, like I can't. And then all the no's, a lot of people will be like, you know, Mark, you know, Marcus doesn't want to do this, doesn't want to do that. And I'm like, I don't know, I just have big, big goals and dreams. And, and, you know, like I said, the people who stayed, the people who kind of understood and, and knew that what, you know, what I had in mind, whether it's, you know, in, in the real world or financially or, you know, health wise, that, you know, when there is free time for me, which is kind of minimal during the week um, because of, you know, YouTube work and business, I'll always reach out to them and always check up on them because, you know, they know me and I know them that, you know, I'll take care of them when, when things do come around and when there's sacrifices to be made for them, I'll obviously make that sacrifice. What I love about your journey thus far is the fact that you're not, you're not scared to let go because you understand that the, that process of like letting go actually allows you to gain. And, yeah. you know, for me, I'm, I'm always sharing this with a lot of people that success really comes down to not what are you willing to, to gain, right? Everybody's always willing. Oh yeah, I'll take this on. I'll do that. I'll do no, it's what are you willing to give up? Like, what are you yeah. willing to literally lose that is so comfortable in your life and so fun? Are you willing to lose those opportunities or those things in order to really focus in on your goal and get it? Yeah. And this Definitely. always then begs a question that I ask a lot of fellow investors. If you were to go back in time and start from ground zero, so zero dollars there, would you change anything? Would your strategy have been differently or would you keep it exactly the same? Sometimes I do wish I could go back to zero because it's just another challenge. And a lot of people will, will view challenge or like adversity as like a bad thing. But if I go back to zero, I would just do the same thing. Work, you know, work two jobs, work hard. You know, for, to me, 40 hours a week is like nothing. Like to me, it's like, you know, I, that's like nothing. I was trying to you know, work hard and then my strategy would be the same thing. And, and if it's the, the same strategy that you have now, then it's hopefully a strategy you have for a long time. You know, 100% of my portfolio was in the SP 500 VU for a while and then obviously added the other, other funds in it. But it would probably be the portfolio I have now, just back in time or right now if I had to start back from zero. But, you know, sometimes I guess I would say maybe for more like individual stocks is you don't, you can't marry your, your stock because sometimes things happen, you know, dividend could get cut. Hopefully not. Um, you know, story of the fund might change or the story of the stock might change. Um, you know, revenues might be decreasing. There might be all these other factors that you can't control. So sometimes it's, it's not good to marry the stock that you have. And a lot of people do marry it. They're like, Oh man, it's down 20% of the year. It'll go back up to all time highs. And then a year later, it's down another 10. A year later, it's later down number, number five. Dividend gets cut. And you're just like kind of hopeless. The cool thing about ETFs though is, you know, those funds will get cut out before hopefully things get too out of hand. You know, if you sticking with a goal and being disciplined with it is going to be like the, the best advice I would give to anybody to succeed, whether it's in uh, their money, investing, or just like, whatever kind of goals they have outside of this. How did you discover the ETFs that you discovered? And what are some of the metrics that we should look into when we're picking or selecting ETFs for our portfolios? To, to find the, the ETFs, it was definitely on YouTube. Um, There's a lot of great creators out there that had s some very good funds. And it was funny because I just invested, I didn't invest in any of them. I was just watching them, just kind of getting some curiosity before I made my own decisions on which fund I wanted to add to VU at a smaller holding. But yeah, just mostly on YouTube and online, there's some great resources. You know, you could go on Google and Google like the best ETFs or best growth ETFs, dividend ETFs, cover call ETFs, 
sector ETFs. And there's always going to be an article or a video that makes it, you know, fully complete breakdown, some better than the others. But I guess online is, is the best way to learn for new funds, at least. And then to select the best ETFs for your portfolio, first thing to do is like not look at share price because a lot of people are like, you know, why would you invest in VU at $500 a share versus SPLG, which is the same thing as VU at like 70, 60 bucks a share. And it's just like, if, one, if they both go up 1%, you're going to get the same return. It's not like just because the stock is $1,000 and the one stock's $10, if it goes up 1% both, like you get the same return. It's not like one's worse than the other. I guess the things you want to look at is kind of like your, is, is your goals because there's so many different ETFs. If your goal is for, you know, some steady income, hopefully some uh, dividend growth because you want to have dividend growth, my opinion, more than just stability uh, of a dividend, you know, hopefully that, that, that you know, Stocks in there growing their dividend, you know, increasing revenues, kind of pay that out more to the shareholders, benefits your pocket and benefits the, sh the share price. Kind of knowing what goals you have, diversification is a big thing. So, you know, you could get into broad market, which is ultra ultra diversification, which is what I say, and then you could get into you know growth ETFs, which are a little bit less diversification, but you still have a huge basket of stocks. And then you could get into like major concentration, but you do have some diversification. With like a, you know, let's say you have a semiconductor ETF, like that's going to be more diversified than owning 100% NVIDIA where you have, you know, NVIDIA and a semiconductor ETF with like a hundred dollar different stocks. So diversification is a big one. Expense ratio is a big one. But thankfully, as time progressed in the finance world, expense ratios are coming down. Fund managers like Fidelity and Vanguard, especially, they're actually slashing their expense ratios compared to what they were like a decade ago. Because if you're going to be competing with Fidelity's, you know, zero expense ratio funds, a fund, I know Vanguard had some funds at like 0.07. Now they're like a 0.05. So they're just trying to compete. And that's a great thing when it comes down to our pockets, just paying less money on, on fees. So diversification, definitely look at the expense ratios. And from there, it's kind of like just looking at, the fund's objectives, which is on the website, because every fund's going to have a different objective, methodology, how they pick their stocks. A huge one is not looking at the, the total return because you have to like kind of look at like why that happened, what were the macros behind that. Sometimes it is a good gauge for future returns. I would say sometimes because it's kind of just like if the S&P 500 is going up in the, in the past four decades or whatever, it's going to almost likely go up in the, in the, in the next decades, hopefully, but there's so many factors that go into picking ETFs that for me, it, 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 it keeps me a job for YouTube, of course, because there's so many different <laughs> things to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, that's my answer to that. You know, it's interesting. I mean, there's thousands upon thousands of stock opportunities and right there along with those opportunities are ETF opportunities. And now the big thing that at least I've seen across YouTube and what a lot of people want to hear about when it comes to passive income are these option income oriented ETFs. Now you are primarily invested there again, and like just keeping it really simple, the, the S and P, what would you ch say to those yield chasers for these ETFs that are like, I don't know, the Teslas of the world. When you go into cover to call ETFs, it is kind of like a, a foreign space to others. The first thing that mistake I see is people look at the dividend yield. And then they don't look at the dividends, how it's paid out. So it's kind of like a volatile payments. Like you'll get one payment higher in one month, next month's lower, and next month's higher, next month's lower, and next month's lower. And then they're looking at, they're not looking at like how the fund is generating their income. And then what the funds, what's the fund objective? Because some people would be like, oh, JEPQ is better than the S&P 500 because it's gone up more than the S&P 500 in the past six months in a bull market where tech was booming. But over a long period of time that will balance out because most of the, the Teslas of the world, all those covered call funds that are just in inception were coming into an inception at a time where the market was going up. So if you're writing call options on the, on, on, the stock, on the underlying stocks that you hold, the values of the stocks will go up because of the market obviously appreciating your returns, but you will actually underperform the index that it hopes to mimic in a sense because of the covered call optionality. So when you have covered calls, you are basically 
foregoing any potential upside on the stock when you execute the call options on the contracts. And then that income is distributed back to you in mostly in the form of monthly dividends. And then you actually don't perform as high as maybe the index you track. And that's something that it's hard to explain to people because, you know, a 12 minute video, I can't really go into, into depth on that. But in terms of like yield chasers, like we get yield max ETFs, like I have a big opinion on them. I like covered call ETFs like JetB, JetQ, et cetera, more than I like those. I like to call them synthetic cover call ETFs, like the Teslas of the world and the whole yield max movement. But because most of them are just like re returning back to capital and then the stock price is going down massively. And then you know, how, how they, how they generate all these funds, obviously the synthetic it, with the testes of the world, they don't really own the funds or the, they don't, they synthetically don't own the funds that they, that they write call options on them. But if you're trying to be a yield chaser, like that's not the way to go. Um, because if you have a stock at hundred dollars a share, and then they pay out $5 in annual dividends. That's what 5% dividend yield. And then if you look at a dividend yield equation, if the, if the stock price goes down to 50, your dividend yield is 10%, but you're not getting paid more in dividends because the stock price is going down. So you're not like getting a, yeah, you might be getting a 10% yield, but the fund is actually going down and you're losing more money investing in the fund. You know, you might be getting these, these hits of dopamine of dividend payments we're looking at the total return of a fund, which I, which, which I, why I love to tell people to do their own research is easy way to go on and just click total returns to see how the it affects the stock. You know, sometimes you might be under underperforming the S and P 500, which is the opportunity cost when you don't invest in that fund. Of course, please don't be a yield chaser, do your own research, extensive research, because just because somebody said something on YouTube doesn't mean it's going to be set in stone as that's the reality. I love, I have great connections outside of YouTube to where I'll be like, Hey, like this cover call fund, like I want to make sure I run by you. And they're like CFA charter holders. They work for like big banks with management. Can you like confirm what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to convey in my video. And that just due diligence and research because there's always new funds coming out, different tactics on how to get people to invest in the fund. But at the end of the day, it's like, if you could be a master at your portfolio, and if somebody asks you a question about your portfolio, you could give them the most direct, complete answer. Then I would say that you're a well-informed investor, but if someone asks you a question about your portfolio and you're dodging the question, or you might not know the answer, then maybe you should do your more research on it. Or when the fun is going down and you're freaking out, maybe that's not the fun for you. I feel like a huge mistake that a lot of investors make is, is not doing the due diligence. And that's always ties into that fear factor. And I'm curious to know on your end, aside from, I mean, that, because that's a huge problem, just no lack of due diligence, lack of understanding. What do you think some of the biggest issues or biggest mistakes rather investors are making young or old? I would say for ETF investors specifically, it's ETF spam. So you have like 20 different holdings, you know, you're owning like SPY, IVV, SPLG, VU, VTI, VT. You're just like over, you're just like over making your company, you're making a, making a portfolio over complex and I guess just way over diversified. So it's kind of like narrowing it down. Sometimes the, uh, less is more, simple is better. And then the biggest thing is just not thinking about the risk of your portfolio. So a lot of young investors are just like, you know, I'm going to go hundred percent to NVIDIA, hundred percent to SMH, hundred percent to VGT. And that's fine. If it fits your, your risk tolerance, your time horizon, your strategy, but when markets, you know, go down, those will actually go down pretty hard. And if you're willing to stomach the volatility, all power to you. If you're not, then just, you need to be more diversified or to have at least some sort of hedging. That's the biggest mistake. And then for at least ETF investors, I've seen, uh, that's, I've seen at least, and then for maybe individual stockholders. Sometimes I've seen too much stocks in a fund. There's a, a good healthy amount of research that says anything over like 25 stocks, the additional benefit of adding another stock is going to be less because of, you know, I guess you have, you already have hopefully a broad diversified basket of 25 stocks. Sometimes it becomes too hard to manage. Maybe on M1 finance, it becomes a little bit better to manage, but 
God damn it. Like 25 holdings or 30, 40, 50 holdings, a hundred holdings. Like it's a lot of stocks to manage. You, there's no way you could really like realistically, like tell a complete story of every single stock, every earnings call, every news article that came out that you could keep up with all these different stocks. Sometimes it's better to have 10, 15, 20 in your portfolio of just individual dividend stocks, or maybe just individual growth stocks or blue chip stocks. And just having those stocks and just doing your, all your research on them, because my philosophy is no more than 5%, maybe no more than 10% into your individual, each individual stock. Cause you want to have some skin in the game. Like if you have a hundred bucks to invest every other week, if you have a hundred stocks, you're going to be putting a dollar into every stock. Like it's not going to motivate you to keep on doing it. You're not going to see high returns, but if you have a lesser amount of stocks in different you know, sectors of the market, that's going to give you more skin into the game, more dividends will come in, capital appreciation will be a lot more than just having less money in the fund or just individual stock. Funny, man. When you say that, I, I think back to 2020 and I just, it, it was like, I was investing everywhere. I spread myself so thin. And it was some months it was like, you know, a dividend of 25 cents. And I'd pop onto YouTube and be like, in this month, a dividend for 25 cents. Like, you know, I had to pretend to be <laughs> excited about that, which it was exciting because, you know, it's hitting the account. But then yeah. in the day, like to your point, you're spread so thin, it's not really making a difference. And it wasn't until I heard a Bill Ackman interview in 2020. And he was like, at any given time, there's only, you know, five to 10, but really just five really good quality companies out there. So what are you doing investing into boatloads of them? And then it yeah. clicked for me. Like I got to, I got to trim the portfolio. Now, 2020 was easily a very interesting year. And I feel like we're just continuously riding these waves of volatility and interest rates splash in the headlines rather recently wars all over the place. But as an ETF investor, I mean, it's simple, but do you do you pay attention to macros? Do they matter at all for you? To me, it's it's it would be foolish to just completely ignore macros. You always want to be aware of what's kind of going on, in, you know, in the news, in the world. And the great thing about uh, at least what I was taught in in school uh, for my economics and finance classes was all the professors wanted you to always know about what's going on with the Federal Reserve, interest rates, inflation, you know, jobs reports, and just kind of what's going on with with the macros. Is it like, uh, it won't ever sway what I'm doing because I know I'm, a, you know, I don't need this money in the next 35, 40 years, but it would be foolish just to ignore it because when things happen, you know, the market goes down like, you know, a good amount or markets going up. Like you want to have a good reason on explaining to somebody like why that might occur. And most likely it's probably because of macros. And or, you know, sometimes earnings season does, does go well and uh, large, especially for large caps, then the market will go up because of the you know outlook of those big companies. But being, you know, it only takes like 15 minutes a day to like, you know, read what's on the Wall Street Journal to do your own research on, on macros. And it's definitely something you want to have taken into account with your invest, you know, as an investor. You want to have a, always a sharp knife. That's what I tell people. You want to always have a sharp knife, be sharp, and be aware of what's going on in the world because it's pretty important. I got an interesting question for you. Let's say you could have dinner with any investor, any of them, the Bill Ackmans of the world, to, to even just say a, a dinner with your father to talk about investing. Literally any investor out there. Who would you want to grab dinner with or perhaps a beer with and just talk about the stock market? It's it's split between Bill Ackman and Peter Lynch. Probably say it would be oh, that's a good question. Probably Bill Ackman. Why? And the, the the cool thing about Bill Ackman is you know how he you know achieved great returns over his you know uh, history of, of managing his his hedge fund. I believe his name it was like Gotham. You know, just to have the, I guess the nerve to just have concentrated holdings. And a lot of people don't understand, like if you want to have a, a great portfolio, most of the great investors out there had concentrated holdings, you know, only held about like five to maybe 15 stocks in their portfolio. And just kind of hearing his, his whole story of picking, you know, individual stocks that he sees, I guess, inefficiencies in the market and just like 
just the whole being kind of more of an activist investor is something that really interests me because that's a thing that other people don't understand is these people like, you know, the Bill Ackman's of the world, they kind of know more information about a company than you do because they'll take a stake in a company, go in there, hopefully, you know, get a better understanding of it, change it around. And then they'll see the returns over there, hopefully in the long run. That guy's been through a, a quite a bit of, of scandals. I remember the, the whole, I believe it was like the whole Herbalife thing, um, shorting Herbalife. And then a lot of investors are like, oh, I don't trust what you hear online because they're just trying to benefit their pocket. Like that's probably the hedge fund people because they had a, a you know, he had a short on Herbalife and then it was not shorting. <laughs> so he's losing money. <laughs> you know, I know his story was kind of interesting of just just being an investor that just had that mindset of like just brilliance of having a concentrated holdings and i just want to know like what he saw in these in these individual stocks that led to such outperformance and then you know not not every, and not every investor is going to get everything right and kind of just with his mentality of okay like how can i find you know you know the next big thing with peter lynch is like the next 10 bagger and for them it's like I want to just know like what's going on in their head that they could see these different things in a company. You know, is it the, is it the balance sheet? Is it the story of the company? Is it the future um, growth of the company? Or is it you literally, I know Peter Lynch said that if, if it's great products and you enjoy it, like you go in there and you just, I don't know, have like a McDonald's burger and you're like, wow, every, everybody here loves it. So I'm going to invest in it. Is that the best way to do it? Mm, I don't know. Cause you could go to like Walgreens and, shop of Walgreens all day and then look at the stock and it's like down like <laughs> 70%. So maybe that's not, a, maybe that's not a great way to, a great way to invest, but just these, these people who had an abundance of wealth and an abundance of, of risk that they just believed that their holdings were going to pan out over time. And that's something that I'm not willing to do is have majority of my net worth in one stock or two stocks, three stocks and be willing to see the end result when maybe things aren't going your way because of macros or the performance of the company. Well, here's the deal. You hit $100,000 age 23. Impressive. Now you got a literally a lifetime ahead of you in terms of investing. And it's obviously a marathon, not a sprint. I'm curious to know if you ever plan on changing your strategy in the slightest to add some individual stocks in. And if you were to do so, which ones would you consider? I definitely know I want to have some individual holdings, but I'm weird. Like I want to go into an individual stock with like a good discount. Like I'm talking with other people this past week and they're like, oh, you know, Google's down this, Meta's down this, this stock is down this amount. And they're like, no, like we, we let, let, let's wait to see if it goes down more and then we'll buy into that discount. And for me, I, I, would, I just want to have like, a good position is like 5,000 or 10,000 in, in the stock. Um, but you also know you have to keep your other funds alive. Like they're kind of like your babies. You kind of, you know, you have to take care of them by buying them to, you know, make them see good returns in the long run. So do I plan on adding individual stocks? Definitely. Do I know when? I don't know. Is it going to be anytime soon? Probably not. The next 10, within the next five or 10 years, well, you know, you have to continue to watch the channel. But I was going to say, stay tuned did, on YouTube. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it would definitely be like a smaller portion of my net worth, like probably no more than like 5%, maybe less than 10% of the portfolio because I'm a firm believer of transparency. I always try to like throw in my account numbers or values, screenshots into my, to my videos and also like kind of like what my holdings are. But if I had to choose some companies, it would probably be more companies that happen to pay a dividend and mostly I would say tech companies just because I just see the future with AI and tech and those types of businesses have super high margins. And, you know, most of, of the big names of the, you know, max seven have huge, you know, increase in revenues every single year. And it's almost like they're just not slowing down, but they're also, you know, despite them paying a dividend, they're also putting money back into R and D to hopefully, you know, make their products better. And they could also have, they have pricing power. So, sure. you know, let's just say an, an Apple has an iPhone, you know, they're going to increase, you know, they could increase the iPhone every single year and people were going to pay for it because 
that's kind of all I, all I know and it's a good it's a good product i definitely have a few stocks in my mind microsoft's a big one i like microsoft a lot just the whole story of the, of the company right now into the future always beating it almost seems like they can't stop missing on or they can't stop not beating earnings i know they, they, they had a pretty okay last earnings call but for just them to just increase in revenues every single every single year it seems like diversification of businesses so you know they have being they're making money on it's increased double digits in terms of revenue every single year linkedin xbox the new the new activision uh, acquisition the cloud with azure is just making insane profits and so it's kind of like I, I could definitely see them growing and having a good management team Microsoft's a good one apples i feel, I feel like apple's new it's gonna be a, another one that people say but i will also throw in like visa or american express don't know why but when credit cards you're always throw you're always swiping your credit card you want to build up credit and all these companies are going to be making money every single day on just the transactions of you know the that that takes from the merchant to the credit card company that they pay out as well as like like the fees that they charge for credit cards and that's not going to slow down like i think credit cards are still going to be something once well into the future but when your terms come to you know sleeping at night with a stock you want to hopefully know that the businesses are continuing to make money credit card companies are always increasing their annual fees it seems like so I would say Visa, Mastercard, no Visa, American Express, Apple, and Microsoft. I would say Nvidia, but I haven't done my research on it, so I'm not going to stay here and be like Nvidia because Nvidia. I, you know, if you ask me why, I'm going to be like, I really don't know. I, I, it's gone up a lot, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I want to hit you with the last question here, and we're going to go in the ETF direction just because that's what you're invested in. If I were to give you right now $10,000 to invest in just one ETF that you had to stick with over the long period of time, which ETF would it be and why? Definitely say the correct answer would be VU. <laughs> it would definitely be, <laughs> it would definitely be uh, you know, the S&P 500, I would say it would, it would be it would be VU just because it's my highest holding and 500 stocks in, in the fund primarily based out of the United States. But a lot of people don't know that most of the stocks are actually making money outside of the country. So it's not like they're getting most of the revenues out of the United States. They're also making money outside of, you know, in, in the world. You know, there's Teslas that are being sold in China. Apple products are almost globally. So when people think, oh, like a company is a U.S. company, like, yes, it is a U.S. company, but they're also making money everywhere. And it's kind of just like Vu and Chill is kind of like my, my, phrase i would say to people but it's also just like sleep at night you know you got decades of past performance that hopefully will yield future returns we don't know if it's going to be 10 in the, in the next 40 years annually but i have so many i have gross stocks in it and i have dividend stocks in it that are more more, more value oriented so it's almost like i can't lose but a lot of people are going to be like okay marcos like if it's not VU, like what would it be i would say SCHG, Schwab's growth ETF. That has many different sectors in it, primarily into technology, but just the way the fund screen stocks, and obviously the you know past history has been great, but how people don't understand like how to what leads to outperformance is to kind of be a little bit more uh, concentrated into holdings, and kind of you know, you're kind of betting on those companies doing well. So for me, if it was like, if someone gave me $10,000 and it wasn't VU, definitely SHG because why they call them growth ETFs, because obviously they have, you know, companies that increase their cash flows faster than the market, you know, average would, but they're picking pretty much tech stocks and then having them at a higher allocation by like, you know, three to four times the one with, with the S&P 500 would. So like 40% of some of these growth funds are like into three different stocks. And it's like Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. So, you know, that's kind of like my bet to hopefully outperform the market. And we're gonna have to see in the next decades to see if SHG or these growth ETFs could continue to outperform the market because, you know, valuations like, you know, we saw kind of a rise into some dividend stocks that actually did well the past couple of weeks. And, you know, are we seeing a, a switch from, 
growth stocks to value stocks outperforming? Because I know in 2021, I believe, dividend stocks were outperforming growth stocks and then it kind of flipped. So I guess I, I don't have a crystal ball, but those are the two funds I would, I would definitely invest in. The to be determined, but a sleep at night fund, in my opinion, definitely. with both of them. Investors, Marcos, Mia on with us on Masters of the Market. Like I said before, you have to go check out his channel, all things personal finance, ETF, investing, everything is there for you. A lot of insights. Marcos, I personally want to thank you for joining me on Masters of the Market. A lot of insights about ETFs. Now, investors, until the next go round of Masters, we will see you all there.